Okay, well, well, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, I, I'm quite impressed that we can provide good quality and up-to-date information because very often we're, uh, we have felt as though we've been working in a little bit of a vacuum uh, uh, for quite a lot of the time where we're getting incomplete and incomprehensible guidance from across government. Uh, so it has been actually a very tough and very demanding job to keep on top of some of these things. And uh, I, I know that there is uh, guidance coming out every day, but if you're getting uh, repeat guidance, if you're getting completely conflicting things coming out, sometimes these things can be a bit difficult to, uh, uh, to, to keep on top of. And one of the key things that we have to do as a trade body, uh, as the Road Haulage Association, is make sure that our members get the best possible information, the most accurate information to make critical business decisions. So first of all, I'd just like to explain just very, very quickly, uh, Um, uh, just very quickly who the Road Haulage Association is and what we do. We represent commercial road haulage operators. That's the people who operate trucks, who carry goods on behalf of other people. Think Eddie Stobart carrying goods for Tesco rather than Tesco carrying goods for Tesco, if you see what I mean. So our members are actually picking up your goods and taking them to your customers. That's what they do. We have around 7,000 members who operate vehicles, many of them are small businesses. Uh, I think 85% of the uh, sector has 20 or fewer lorries. That gives you an idea of how long the tail is of small businesses in our sector. Those businesses do not have the time to check government guidance all of, the, all of the time. That's why we have played such an active role in trying to keep them informed and other trade bodies as well. Uh, and I have to say, uh, many trade bodies, just like we are with WSTA and very many others, are cooperating and sharing information all of the time because that's the only way you can keep on top of things because you think you know something and then you find out from another trade body you don't really know. It's been a huge challenge. Our members operate about a quarter of a million lorries. That's about half of the UK uh, lorry fleet is in the commercial road haulage sector. Now they deal with the, all of these people deal with the nuts and bolts of road haulage and they deal with the nuts and bolts of international road haulage. It is fundamental, the changes that are going to be happening uh, in international road haulage if there, is a, if there is a Brexit and if there is a no deal Brexit it's going to be really uh, very difficult. Uh, they, have to deal, they are dealing with the situation at the moment a little bit was like it was described earlier on it's just routine. You can deliver to Dorking in our industry at any rate. You can deliver to Dorking or Dusseldorf. It really doesn't make much difference. You guys in your industry are dealing with something much more complicated. You're very much more used to dealing with the sheer scale of paperwork. For the vast majority of businesses that are non-excise businesses, they have almost no paperwork to deal with in a European environment. And so they're dealing with a change which is enormous for them. For you, dealing with new customs requirements and what have you is going to be less of, a, less of an issue. Now, I'd just like to say one thing. that bef I actually did the slides before yesterday's announcement. So this is the slides were done sort of a week, 10 days ago. So please don't read anything into any of the slides um, as a political commentary at all, because <laughs> it isn't. It isn't. That was done over a week ago, and it was nothing to do with the deal or no deal or anything like that. It was just because I wanted to cheer people up, because it can be pretty depressing thinking about uh, Brexit. It's a real challenge to actually go through this process and, and feel so out of control so much of the time. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story about how things have changed, and one of the reasons why I put this smiley face there was because about 10 weeks ago I went down to Dover for a meeting at the Dover, Port of Dover. And Michael Gove was chairing the meeting. And he came into the, uh, into the room and his, his basic uh, idea was, we need to get ready. Everyone needs to get ready, wake up, smell the coffee, this is really going to happen. We want a deal, but preparation for the 31st of October has to crack on. He basically said that whatever happens, whether there is a deal or no deal, customs formalities and international trading formalities are going to radically change. 
It's either going to be in January next year or January the year after next, or it's going to be uh, October, was the story he was telling. So his key point there was, whatever you're doing to prepare for Brexit is not going to be wasted because it's going to happen at some point, was the message he was, he was giving us. So we, all of the trade bodies there, there were ports, there were um, logistics companies, customs agents, border force were there, the Kent police were there, everyone involved in the border, border thing were at this round table. And we were invited to pass comment on what we see as the problem. Many people raised a lot of issues. The agents raised issues about duty deferments and lack of staff and a whole range of things. The ports, the hauliers, everyone was, was, was raising there. But I have to tell you that we were absolutely clear. I personally was absolutely clear with Michael Gove at that meeting that come the 31st of October, the haulage industry will not be ready. The haulage industry will not be able to carry goods over the border in the quantity that they do now if things happen on the 31st of, Oct of October. It's impossible. So they knew that. They know that. And one of the things that came back to us is, OK, what do we need to do to change things? What do we need to do to get ready? And I have to tell you, in the last 10 weeks, there has been decisive action. And the reason for this smiley face was just to tell you that in the last 10 weeks or so, we had the decision on EORI numbers, automatic issuing of EORI numbers to VAT registered businesses. That happened. Uh, an extension to the safety and security declaration requirements inbound to the UK. That happened and was extended. A whole range of things that businesses have been asking for have happened extra money to fund customs clearance agent training, that has happened. So there has been a real change fr driven from the top, from Michael Gove and the senior ministers in terms of forcing preparation. I think they've spent far too much money in the wrong places probably, but at the end of the day, they could have given us more money in the Road Haulage Association, we'd have liked that. I'm sure the WSTA would have liked some free money as well. Unfortunately, free money is not on the slides, but they are very, very concerned about the shortcomings. And at least they've tried. But I have to tell you that there is still a huge amount of uncertainty, an overwhelming amount of uncertainty over some fairly fundamental border processes. And it's really difficult to prepare the whole supply chain when there are processes that people are unfamiliar with and do not know how to do things. So, let's just talk about when. Um, this slide, as I say, was written before, uh, before we knew to, that was going to be a deal, but actually nothing has changed yet. When could be the 1st of November? When could be the 1st of February next year? When could be the 1st of January 2021? Or it could be somewhere else if the politicians in, invented. Now, that causes huge uncertainty. And I think one of the speakers earlier on said, we did a load of preparation for March, but stuff it, we're not bothering this time. We're not bothering for, for November because we'll just wait and see what happens. And I have to tell you, that is not an uncommon story. Now, I've not heard it in this sector in particular. I've heard it from hauliers. I've heard it from businesses and customers of hauliers. There is a lot of people who've gone, I'm just going to wait and see, and I'm going to do something about it when it happens, if it happens. Uh, I've already said that it's impossible for us to be ready uh, by the time of the 1st of November. I think any no-deal Brexit of any form is going to be very difficult. And it's going to be very difficult because some of the things you were talking about earlier on today, where you automatically fall out of European systems and there is no backup and you're going to have to manually do processes, well, you repeat that across all of the businesses and trades uh, around, you can see how much more complex things are going to get. So the when thing is really important. When we change is important, but how we change to a Brexit is also important. And I want to talk about some of the specifics, if I may, uh, about uh, the things that have worried us right from day one. Three things have always bothered us in the RHA. Labour has been a real problem for us. 
Uh, we have a lot of non-UK drivers. We have lost drivers going back to Poland, Lithuania, and what have you. It's not an uncommon story. I'm sure that you will have businesses where your warehouses are having the same sort of issues. And, and part of that is a, a haulage industry. We have to treat our staff much better than we have done in the past. Drivers do not get a, a, an easy ride in uh, distribution centres and around the place. So we as an industry, the road haulage industry, have a responsibility to improve things. But we also have a responsibility to make sure government knows if it puts restrictions on the movement of labour or how those restrictions on the movement of labour happen are going to have a direct impact on how we can service the distribution and supply chains of the UK. But that sort of is in the uh, gift of the UK government to actually think in terms of its migration policy. So I'll leave that to one side. The second thing about Brexit that is a real uh, knotty one for us is the issue of permits and licences and those sort of routine uh, things that hauliers have to do. Uh, a road haulage company in the UK has to have a community licence that allows them to do international haulage in and out of the uh, EU. It's a routine thing. Uh, the EU has given us a contingency uh, programme. It is going to allow UK hauliers to keep trading for nine months after any Brexit. So that's actually a contingency that's been put in place to continue to allow the free flow of lorries. So that's not worrying us. It does a bit, but from your point of view, it's, it's down in the detail. Licenses, driving licenses, all of those sorts of things. You may have uh, come across the need for international driver's permits if you're going around Europe. Well, that's been negotiated and bilateral stuff has come out. There's only three now that you need an, uh, a, an international driver's permit for. You need one for France, you need one for Italy, and you need one for Cyprus. The rest of the EU, you can drive on a UK licence after, after Brexit. That's a real change from, from where we were. Um, some of the post offices don't necessarily know that. They'll still sell you international driver's permits if you're going to Germany, but that's because somehow the information hasn't cascaded down there. Driver's hours rules, uh, all the things to do with the qualifications of drivers and transport managers, all of that is really for our industry to worry about. And to be honest, it's sort of under control. So day one, no deal. Trucks are still going to be able to move. European trucks are going to be unrestricted. They're going to be able to come in and out like now. Now, bear in mind that 85% of the road haulage that's done between the EU and the UK is in non-UK trucks. That means the lorries themselves are going to continue to have the permission to, to, to move. But our real problem, the what problem, the big what problem, is the customs and border issue. That is by far and away the most difficult and most uh, intransigent for us. So I want to talk briefly about responsibilities. Uh, over here we talk about the hauliers. You may not be able to see this at the back, but basically it says... Hauliers and drivers need the correct documentation to go through a port. If you do not have the correct documentation to go through a port, you will not get out of the UK. Coming back into the UK, the export customs documentation that will be expected will be exactly uh, will be the export customs entries. They're going to expect that, or you're going to need to be in transit. They won't, they'll orange you, lane you in Calais. They won't let you out of the EU if you don't have the right paperwork. The UK customs authorities have, as has just been explained, done a load of easements and simplifications, the TSP, the automatic issuing of EORI numbers, which some European countries had done before the UK, by the way. Um, they've tried to make it as easy as possible uh, so that we do not have clutter at the, at the ports. But the European side of this equation are following the rules. They are following the rules without... Uh, any real easements. So they're expecting you to have a proper customs documentation for every shipment in a lorry. Now this is where it concerns us because some of our members are carrying, lorry, uh, carrying uh, uh, shipments across, there can be 200, 300, 400 shipments on a single lorry. We have one of our members who actually took a photo and we went along to, we were at a meeting with HMRC and in the, showed a photo of a lorry with 13,000 individual shipments in it. Each one needs 
export customs declarations, import customs declarations. That's not a sustainable business model, by the way. That's not going to stay like that. People aren't going to send them shipments, parcels in that sort of way in future. But it's how it happens now. Now, the key point for us is, as hauliers, knowing that you are going to need this documentation, we're saying to, to our, our members, the driver should not attempt to cross the border in either direction without the required paperwork. We're telling our members, if the paperwork's not in place, don't pick up the goods. Don't go. So if the paperwork isn't there, and this would include excise as well, this includes all customs paperwork, don't even pick the goods up. And I can tell you, there is a huge shortage of people to do the right sort of customs paperwork. There will be plenty of people who do try, there will be people who do it, but there's a very, very good chance that people are going to end up being in Dover and sent to Manston for an indeterminate amount of time while people sort out their paperwork, particularly going outbound. Now, something you should also remember about this, don't think about it as, oh, it's okay if it's, if it's outbound, they'll just go out empty and then they'll come in full and they'll, they'll find a way. Bear in mind that outbound pays for the part of the round trip. People won't come in if they don't have outbound trip shipments because they'll either charge a lot more for the whole round trip to the exporter in Europe. It's going to be a very challenging period of time. I'm not going to go through the passports and visas and the driver requirements uh, any further. Now, I want to talk about Ireland briefly. I looked for a photo of the Irish border on Google, and I got this. That's an Irish border collie. Yeah, instead of having that lovely green picture of a stream or whatever, I thought, no, let's, let's it's a dog. It's an Irish Border Collie. He knows more about the border in Ireland than I do. Uh, he's an expert in the Irish Border. He's even named after it. So he must be an expert. I have to say that with nine days to go until a possible Brexit, the level of uncertainty on the Irish Border surpasses anything that, that we have on uncertainty about processes uh, on the EU. I have to say that for the land border, it's a mystery. It's a complete mystery for our members. We're piecemeal information, rumours, innuendo. If he could speak English, I would, I, I would know a lot more, but he doesn't. He just barks and does stuff. But, um, in terms of the sea border, the intention from the Irish side is to apply the full EU customs rules and the safety, requirement for safety and security declarations and the requirement for all of the paperwork and everything exactly the same as the French, the Belgians, and the uh, Spanish and the Dutch. For road haulage, this is a really huge challenge. So I want to talk about what are the big problems, summarise if you like, what are the big problems from our side, bearing in mind that we're a service to you, you guys. Without us doing our bit, you can't, you can't Get your goods. So the things that are worrying us, INCO terms was mentioned earlier on, and I mentioned INCO terms because I want you to think about your trading relationship with your supplier or the people that you sell to. You need to be very clear on who's paying the freight, who is responsible for the customs clearance on both sides of the channel, whether it's you, whether it's them, whether it's you on one side and them on the other, and how that shipment is going to move is absolutely critical for you to get your goods. Are you using a logistics company that's going to use CTC, the, the transit convention, or are you going to have uh, a supplier in France who is actually going to use an agent in, 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 in France to do the customs export work? These are questions you need to discuss with your partners overseas. If you don't get this right, you've got every chance of, certainly for if people follow our advice, of not going anywhere with your goods. So INCO terms is not just some wild technical thing. It is the fundamental relationship between you and the person you supply or the person you buy from. So please, please look at that very carefully. The second thing that worries us is vendor-generated information. At the moment, people who are uh, sending shipments, uh, the word stuff was mentioned as a, uh, uh, a trailer full of stuff. 
people have to, have to actually generate the right information. And that information comes from the person who is doing the actual export, the exporter of the goods. They know what the goods are. They know how many packages there are. They have the commercial invoice, which should have all the data necessary for the agent to do the customs declaration. We are very concerned about the lack of skills and knowledge amongst people who are selling goods on what information they need to provide and who they need to provide it to. So please focus on that, on the vendor-generated information. For us as an industry, the, another key thing, the third of the four things I'm going to mention, is the requirement for an ENS safety and security declaration. One declaration by a haulier for every single shipment in a lorry is a huge administrative burden. They, don't, they will not have time to have incomplete information and to deal with things. One of the reasons we're telling people refuse to carry goods if you don't have all of the information is if you don't have the information for the safety and security declarations, you're going to get fined in France. You'll be pulled over, stuck in an orange lane, and you'll be, you, you, everything's going to be delayed. It's going to be hell in a handbasket. So that's one of the reasons we're giving that very clear advice. And the fourth thing I wanted to highlight to people, just before I depress you even more, there is not enough customs agents here or in the EU to handle Roro freight at the moment. If we do get a delay until uh, February next year, things will be better. The UK government has spent some money on some training, and I understand some other, other governments have spent money on training customs agents, and that's really useful. But where we are today, if you don't have a regular logistics company and, a, and an agent who can do your customs for you and for your customer overseas or your supplier overseas, people are going to be in trouble and you may not be able to move your goods. They are the big supply chain problems. Um, I have to say that for me, I don't think there's going to be massive disruption on the roads in Kent. I think the problem is going to be in the warehouses in Europe and the UK on goods that are not going to be able to move at all. I think there's going to be a mix. There will be road problems, but there's going to be people who aren't going to be able to move their goods and they're going to be looking for new ways. Expect some, uh, expect some issues. Uh, I'm finishing up now. Um, and I wanted to actually finish on an optimistic note, sort of like a bit book in the, the smiley face. Um, the sun's going to come up the day after Brexit happens. It is going to come up. The logistics people are going to work through these problems. All of the things that we're talking about are solvable. We are dealing with a major, major change. The transition is going to be very difficult to do, and it's going to affect a lot of businesses. You need to protect yourself. You need to think about what you do to make sure that you do not pick up liabilities that are not your fault. We're telling our members, make sure you do not take on liabilities and obligations that are not yours. Make sure that you, if you're caught in congestion caused by a shipper or a consignee, make sure that you can make a claim against them. If they haven't given you the right paperwork and there's fines and there's things like that, you need to protect yourself is the advice we're giving to our members. So do think about how you do things. But it'll get better. It'll get better over time. Systems will improve. And that's really all I've got to say. Um, I think as an industry, you're probably better based than most because you're far more used to doing the excise type paperwork, which is for many traders in, in the EU is absolutely alien now. So thank you very much.